Let me open up our time together with a word of prayer this morning. Father, as we open the scripture this morning and prepare to hear from you through your word, we are thankful for the way that you have blessed us throughout this previous year. Father, we thank you for the ministry that has been accomplished by your people in this local place, in this local church. We're thankful as well for the extension of the gospel that you've provided for our church family uh, through our missionary partners. Many of them have concluded their ministry day or will soon conclude their ministry day. Father, we pray for them today. For those who have concluded their services and their outreaches, that you would give them good rest that you would encourage them with a sense of your favor and your pleasure in their service for you. For those who are currently ministering the scripture, we pray for strength and grace for them. That your word would go out with power and with authority and that you would accomplish uh, that thing that you send it out to do in the lives of those who receive it. And Father, we pray for our church family this morning. We we have a heavy sense this morning of being scattered, uh, and, and uh, we are thankful for the technology that allows us to gather around your word together, but we sense the loss of physical closeness. We sense the loss of lifting our voices up in worship to you, and Father, our prayer is that this would be a, a one-week uh, providence from you. And that we would gather together next Lord's Day to worship you together as an assembly. And so, Father, we pray that throughout this week that you would bless and protect our church family, that you would protect from sickness, that you would encourage those who are discouraged, that you would provide ministry opportunities, that we would take uh, opportunities to share the gospel with neighbors, with co-workers, and with family members that we would reach out to one another and demonstrate the love of the family of Christ, uh, that we would check in with one another and provide for each other's physical needs, and that you would accomplish your good and your wise purposes in our congregation as you accomplish those purposes in each one of us individually. And so, Father, we thank you for this time, uh, for the opportunity to open your word together. We pray that you would bless through it. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I mentioned in our announcement time, we, we did have a plan for the last couple of weeks. And that plan was that last Lord's Day, uh, we would enjoy our Christmas program together. And that next Sunday, we would announce a theme for the year to focus our attention. And we would uh, set our sights on 2021. And that plan has changed. <laughs> and so I've been kind of left uh, between a Christmas series and resuming our study in the Minor Prophets in January. I've been left wondering what we should meditate on this morning. Where should we go in the scripture this morning to set our minds in a particular direction as we close out uh, what has been a very challenging year? And as we step off into the unknown of a new year, I told Allie, this is the most 2020 thing ever, that uh, the last Sunday of the year, uh, I would uh, get COVID and, and uh, we'd have to quarantine the church staff and we wouldn't be able to gather in person. This is just peak 2020 uh, happening right now. How do, how do we respond to these things? What, what do we find in Scripture to help us to navigate in our own minds what's happened in this last year and to prepare ourselves and to prepare our hearts as we move into the unknown of a new year. I actually want to encourage you to turn with me in your Bible to what I consider to be an overlooked book, and that is the book of Lamentations. Would you turn with me to the book of Lamentations? We'll be giving our primary attention to chapter 3, but I would like to point out uh, some details of the book in other passages. If you're having trouble finding Lamentations, it's grouped with the major prophets. 
Uh, it comes right after Jeremiah and right before Ezekiel. Uh, we have had a study in the Minor Prophets throughout the month of November, and uh, you might remember that the Minor Prophets are called that not because they're less important, but because they're shorter. Lamentations is an unusual book because it's lumped in with the Major Prophets, but it's shorter than some of the Minor Prophets are. Uh, but Lamentations finds itself where it is in our Old Testament canon because of its authorship. It is traditionally assumed that Jeremiah is the author of the book of Lamentations, and I find no compelling reason to doubt Jeremiah's authorship of this book, even though the book itself does not make that claim. Do you remember in November when we studied the book of Habakkuk? Do you remember that we said that Habakkuk is a lament? And here we've turned to lamentations, an entire book of lament as well. Do you remember the struggle that Habakkuk had that's recorded in that book? He starts out in chapter 1, and he really offers a prayer of complaint to God because of the wickedness of his own nation, the nation of Judah. And he cries out to the Lord, and he says, Look at the wickedness of your people. Aren't you going to do something? Don't you hear our prayer? And God responds to Habakkuk and tells him, Yes, I am going to do something. I'm going to use the Babylonian Empire to chasten my people Judah. Do you remember, does, does that solve Habakkuk's struggle, his conundrum? <laughs> no, it actually creates a new challenge for him. He, he replies to God and says, the Babylonian, I mean, I wanted you to do something, but not that thing. How can God be righteous and use a nation like the Babylonians, a nation more wicked than Judah? How can God use Babylon to judge his own people? This creates a real crisis of faith for Habakkuk as he tries to sort through what he knows to be true about God and what he sees in his circumstances. And again, God graciously responds to Habakkuk and tells him, in essence, don't worry about the Babylonians, I'm going to judge them too. And God is so sovereign, and He is so elevated in His greatness and His glory, that it is no conflict of God's character to chasten His own people with a wicked nation, and then hold that wicked nation accountable for the the injustice and the oppression that they carry out in that chastening. And so Habakkuk comes to a point where he simply has to rely on what he knows to be true about God and interpret his circumstances through the character of God, not reinterpret God's character through his circumstances. You might be wondering what Lamentations has to do with the book of Habakkuk, but the reality is that Lamentations is a response to God's prophecy to Habakkuk coming true. What I mean by that is that Jeremiah laments in this book, he's responding to the destruction and the exile of the city of Jerusalem to the Babylonian Empire. What God told Habakkuk would happen, that he would judge and chasten his people through Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar, that has come to pass. Jeremiah lives through, experiences as an eyewitness, the unfolding of the judgment that God prophesies in the book of Habakkuk. Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet because he is moved to tears over the devastation and the loss and the destruction that God brings to, to Judah through Babylon. You can read about that in the book of Jeremiah. But here, that, that, that disruption of Jeremiah's soul comes to its fullest expression here in the book of Lamentations. It's good for us to be reminded a little bit about Jeremiah and his calling. He is a very unpopular prophet, not that any of the prophets were particularly popular with the people. But you have to understand that Judah, in their political situation, is caught between these two great empires. The Babylonian Empire to their, to their northeast, and the Egyptian Empire to their southwest. 
And, and the political scheming of Judas' leaders is that the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And so Judah is constantly looking to Egypt for help as a counterbalance against the power and the authority of Babylon. Jeremiah's message from God is actually that Judah should take a pro-Babylonian stance. Jeremiah's message to the people is, this is God's plan for chastening. Don't fight against the Babylonians, accept the exile that they bring. Don't flee to Egypt. Submit yourself to the chastening of God. This is where Jeremiah tells the people, seek the good of the city that you go to. Have your children marry and plant gardens and build houses because you're going to be there a while. You can imagine how unpopular a message that was. I mean, if we heard something like that in our situation today, we would point at somebody and say, that, that is a, a traitor. That's an unpatriotic person. And yet Jeremiah had a word from the Lord that this was God's doing. This was what God was going to bring about. And yet Jeremiah is not unmoved in his soul by the difficulty and the destruction and the utter desolation that comes upon Jerusalem through the exile into Babylon. You actually see that in the Hebrew title for the book of Lamentations. In the Hebrew Bible, the name of this book is the Hebrew word for how. You might think that's kind of a, a strange name for a book of the Bible to call it how, but you see where that name comes from if you look at chapter 1, verse 1. How, how does Lamentations begin in your English Bible? With that word, how doth the city sit solitary that was full of people? How is she become as a widow, she that was great among the nations, and princess among the provinces, how is she become tributary, a slave, a vassal state? She weepeth sore in the night, and her tears are on her cheeks. Among all her lovers, she hath none to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They are become her enemies. Judah is gone into captivity because of affliction and because of great servitude. She dwelleth among the heathen. She findeth no rest. All her persecutors overtook her between the straits. The ways of Zion do mourn because none come to solemn feasts. All her gates are desolate. Her priests sigh. Her virgins are afflicted. And she is in bitterness. If you turn to chapter 2, verse 1, you find that chapter beginning with the same word. How hath the Lord covered the daughter of Zion with a cloud in his anger? Chapter 1, you have this uh, gut-wrenching description of the desolation faced by the city of Jerusalem. Chapter 2 begins by telling us, ultimately, who has brought this upon Jerusalem. See, we, we might say, well, this is Babylon's doing, or this is Nebuchadnezzar's doing, but Jeremiah knows what's happening here. How hath the Lord covered the daughter of Zion with a cloud in his anger, and cast down from heaven unto the earth the beauty of Israel, and remembered not his footstool in the day of his anger? Verse 2, the Lord hath swallowed up all the inhabitations of Jacob. This has come upon them because of the judgment of God. Yes, through Babylon as a tool, as an instrument of God's will, but God is sovereign over what is happening here. That's really the theme of chapter 2. Chapter 1 begins with a description of the desolation that Judah has faced. Chapter 2 reminds us of who has done this. This word how actually turns up again in chapter 4, verse 1. How is the gold become dim? How is the most fine gold changed? The stones of the sanctuary are poured out in the top of every street. And so you see this repetition of the word how to describe the deep distress and destruction of the nation of Jerusalem. So it actually serves as a fitting title for the book. 
Lamentations is structured around five chapters that are five, really, what we would call poems. Some people refer to them as a dirge, like a, like a funeral poem. And they're highly structured. You'll notice that chapters 1, 2, 4, and 5 are all 22 verses long. They have 22 stanzas. In chapters 1, 2, and 4, those chapters are arranged as an acrostic. There are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Each one of those stanzas begins with another letter. This is kind of like the structure that we see in Psalm 119. So chapters 1, 2, and 4, 22 stanzas, each beginning with the next Hebrew letter. It's, it's almost like Jeremiah's idea here is to show you the destruction of Jerusalem from A to Z. That, that this is the completeness of that destruction. Chapter 3 breaks the pattern because it has 66 stanzas. And actually what you have there is you have this acrostic is tripled. And so you have three stanzas beginning with the first letter of the alphabet. And then three more stanzas beginning with the second letter of the alphabet. And so on throughout the chapter. Chapter 5 doesn't follow the acrostic pattern, but it still has 22 stanzas. And so I, I say all this just to communicate that this is a highly structured uh, piece of poetry that Jeremiah has crafted by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in the depth of his sorrow and his despair. You say, well, that's really nice, but what's the point of telling us that there's structure to the book? Well, the structure highlights the, the purpose of the author and points to what is very important. And the structure of the book communicates that the climax of Jeremiah's experience shared here in this book is found in chapter 3, where this A to Z formula is actually multiplied. It's tripled. It's three times over. And as a matter of fact, in the middle of all of these descriptions of the great suffering of Judah, we find right in the middle of chapter 3 a statement of Jeremiah's hope. How do we respond in great difficulty? What do we meditate on when we face significant challenges and trials in life? Thankfully, even though 2020 has been a difficult year, I don't know that any of us have experienced something on the level of what Jeremiah experienced. That's not to say that we won't. That's not to say that we haven't experienced great personal loss, even if it doesn't rise to the level of national calamity that we see here in Lamentations. Each one of us has suffered discouragements, disappointments, personal losses, and difficulties throughout the last year. And not to be prophetic, but, but I just challenge us that it's very likely that we're going to face those disappointments and difficulties and challenges again in 2021. I think your, your uh, history of your life just bears this out. Has there ever been a year, even the best year in your life, where you did not face challenges? Where you didn't have to make a choice about how you were going to respond to difficulties that you find in your life. That's why books like this, books like Habakkuk, books like Job, and books like Lamentations, and stories like the story of Joseph, and even, I must say, the story of our Savior, who faced the greatest injustice the world has ever seen, who, who, who prayed with what the writer of Hebrews tells us, were great sweat drops of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. Those stories in the Scripture that we might overlook or we might think aren't the happiest stories to read about, they encourage us, they arm us, they instruct us, they empower us to respond when we face difficulties in our own lives. The, the more I read of the Scripture and the more I study of the Scripture, the, the, the more I recognize that one of the most prevalent themes in all of the Bible is how God's people respond to trial. It's as if trials and difficulties are on every page of the Bible. And here they find a, a, a culmination, a knot, a, a concentration here in the book of Lamentations. I should just point out 
where chapter 1 is confronting us with the difficulty of Jerusalem in the exile. Chapter 2 is reminding us that God has done it. Uh, chapter 5, Jeremiah is responding to the Lord with a prayer not to forget their plight and forget their circumstance. Chapter 3 becomes seriously personal. You can see that again in the, in the very first verse. I am the man that hath seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. Do you hear how personal this becomes for Jeremiah? This is not a theoretical exercise. This is not theology written in a book. This is theology lived. This is theology experienced. Jeremiah says in verse 2 of chapter 3, He hath led me and brought me into darkness, not into the light. Surely against me is he turned. He turneth his hand against me all the day. My flesh and my skin hath he made old. He hath broken my bones. He hath builded against me and compassed me with gall and travail. He hath set me in dark places as they that be dead of old. Have you ever experienced such a difficulty and such a disappointment in your life that you would cry out with Jeremiah and say, God has afflicted me personally. The hand of God has come against me. Regardless of what's happening in the nation, regardless of what's happening with my people, the reality is that God is afflicting me. Do you hear how this is personal for Jeremiah? And then you add on top of this that, that, that Jeremiah is not just experiencing this as a citizen of Jerusalem, but, but his affliction is actually increased by the fact that he's been faithful to God. He's been faithful to God's message. He, he's not only known the afflictions brought by the Babylonians, but he's known the, the rejection and the oppression of his own people because he has dared to tell them the truth from God. Perhaps you've felt like that. Perhaps you've faced difficulties in your own family where the challenges that you, were, you faced were, were heightened by your faithfulness to God and to His Word, by your unwillingness to compromise the truth. And so you have faced even greater affliction, even greater oppression in your workplace or in your family because of your desire to remain faithful to God. How do you respond to that kind of difficulty? How does Jeremiah respond to that kind of difficulty? I want to direct our attention to verse 19. There's really a section in chapter 3 that, that begins with verse 19. It's a transition, and it runs all the way through verse 33 of chapter 3. This is going to be the section I want to specifically call to our attention this morning. Lamentations 3, verses 19 through 33. Jeremiah, in verse 19, is describing what he has set his mind on, what he's made his meditation. Remembering my affliction and my misery, the wormwood and the gall, that, that expression, wormwood and gall, is just a, a very poignant way of describing the bitterness of soul that Jeremiah has experienced. Remembering his affliction and his misery and the bitterness of his situation. Verse 20, my soul hath them still in remembrance and is humbled in me. How, how does Jeremiah respond when he remembers his circumstances and the affliction and the bitterness and the difficulty? We, we may actually lose some of the significance of this in our King James Version, because we read the word humbled, and we, we tend to interpret that in a positive sense. We say, okay, well, maybe this is a good thing. He's, he's meditating on his difficulties, and his soul is humbled. That's a good outcome. But this word is much stronger than what we would tend to think of when we think of being humbled. Uh, maybe a closer description for us would be humiliated. But even that takes kind of the wrong connotation. The, the word here has the sense of being bowed down 
being crushed, being discouraged. I, I thought it was interesting, one translation, uh, they get a little interpretive here, but they use the word depressed. That's a word that we all understand. When I remember my affliction and my bitterness, and my soul has these things as their meditation, I am bowed down within me. I am discouraged and despondent and depressed. You say, that's a really encouraging message the Sunday after Christmas. But look at what he goes on to say in verse 21. This I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. Do you see that Jeremiah has a choice to make about what he remembers, what he sets his attention to, what he meditates upon? If he meditates on the affliction that bows down his soul, and he tells us, yet this I recall to my mind, and it gives me hope. He intentionally brings to his mind and brings to remembrance something that gives him hope. Isn't that what we want in affliction and difficulty? We want some kind of expectation of the future. We want to see some kind of end of the tunnel or that there's some good coming out of this, that God has not completely rejected us and turned away from us. What is it that Jeremiah sets his mind to that gives him hope? Look at verse 22. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because His compassions fail not. Just like Habakkuk, who had to interpret his circumstances based on what he knew about God, rather than reinterpreting what he knows about God based on his circumstances, just like that situation for Habakkuk, Jeremiah responds to his difficulty by meditating on the character of God. When you face a difficulty in your life, it will always be the character of who God is that brings you hope. Jeremiah had a choice to make. He could focus on the affliction and the difficulty, or he could focus on the truth about who God is. This is a very weighty statement in verse 22 when we're told that it's of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. That term translated mercies is a famously difficult word to bring over into English from Hebrew. And it's not because we don't know what it means. We, we know what it means. It's just there's no single English equivalent for the depth of meaning of this Hebrew word. This is a word that describes God's love, but it's not simply love in the way we think of it. It describes God's loyal love, but not loyalty for no reason. It's, it's God's covenant faithfulness. This is a word that describes the steadfastness of God in His affection for His people because of the commitment that He has made to them. It is because of God's loving loyalty to His own promises, to His own people, that we are not consumed. This is what Jeremiah says. It is because of that steadfast, loyal love, and because God's compassions, His mercies, do not fail. They are abundant. That word compassions or mercies has the idea that, that not only does God withhold judgment from us, but He goes beyond that. He gives us, he gives us more than we deserve. This is similar to how the Apostle Paul describes in Romans chapter 5 the transaction of the gospel through Jesus Christ. It, it's not as if Jesus, as the second Adam, puts us right back in the garden as innocent people with the same choice to make and the same righteousness to earn that Adam and Eve had. Jesus Christ, as the second Adam, doesn't just put us back in the garden as innocents. He gives us His own earned righteousness so that it is as if we have made the right choice. 
And we have chosen to obey God. And we are eternally secure in the paradise of God. Do you see that? God doesn't through Christ just solve our problem initially. He goes so much further. He goes so far beyond. He gives us what we could not accomplish on our own. This is the idea communicated in this passage. It is because of God's loyal love that we're not consumed and because that kind of mercy, that kind of compassion that goes above and beyond with God, it does not fail. They are new, verse 23, every morning, great is thy faithfulness. That's probably the most famous single verse in the book of Lamentations. But as many famous verses it loses some of its significance when you take it out of its context. The, the real punch of the verse that God's mercies are new every morning and His faithfulness is great, the punch is that that is on the lips of a man who is enduring great agony and great affliction. And that's the meditation that brings him hope. Do you realize that every morning you wake up, that's a demonstration of the mercy and the grace of God? That, that God's faithfulness is never exhausted. You know, sleep is a little bit of an image of death, right? And so we go to sleep where we're unconscious of what's going on around us. We have no control of what's going on around us. And God brings us back to wakefulness in the morning. The very act of getting up in the morning is to serve as a reminder to us that God's faithfulness never runs out. That God's mercy and His grace is never exhausted. And that God always keeps His promises and He's always faithful to His covenant even when His people are not. This is the whole question for Jeremiah. Isn't this nation God's chosen people? Has God rejected them finally? Has He turned away from them ultimately? Will the end of the story of the nation of Israel, the people of Abraham, uh, the children of Isaac and Jacob, is the end of their story going to be the exile into Babylon? The confidence that we have here is that's not the end of the story for God's people. It's not the end of the story for Israel, and it's not the end of the story for the church. Because God is always faithful to His covenant promises even when His people are not. And so God pursues. God shows mercy. God calls. God accomplishes. And yes, there are times of affliction. Sometimes we face times of affliction simply because we live in a world that's cursed by sin. And so people die. And people suffer pain. And sometimes we face affliction because of the consequences of our own sinful choices. Sometimes we face affliction because God is directly chastening us. I just want to encourage you this morning, if you think you can sit down and evaluate your life and you can separate all of those afflictions, I'm not sure that's anything we can ever do. Who knows why difficulties come into our lives? And who can trace the string between one difficulty and its cause? In many ways, that's a fool's errand. The confidence comes through knowing who God is. And knowing His character. And knowing His faithfulness to His covenant. Just like God would not finally and ultimately reject His chosen people, Israel. When the Holy Spirit of God brings new life by the righteousness and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, God never ultimately rejects that person. Where the Holy Spirit takes up indwelling residence, He never moves out. He never goes away. God's faithfulness is great. And His mercy is renewed every morning. So what do we meditate on in difficulty? Do we call to our memory all of the bitterness 
and all of the affliction and all of the difficulty and we make that our meditation, we roll it over and over and over and over again in our minds, looking at every facet and obsessing over every detail? Or do we meditate on the person and the character and the work of God? Make that your mental obsession. Take those truths and roll them around in your mind and examine every facet and be uh, entranced with every detail. This is one of the reasons that when we begin our worship services together, we begin with a truth about God. One reason is because worship is in response to who God is. God is the object of our worship. He's the one we address our worship to, but He's also the subject of our worship. He's the one we're worshiping about. And so we have to know something about God in order to worship Him. We have to have some content of our worship. And so it's good for us to begin by being reminded of some truth about God. But the second reason that we begin our worship services with truths about God is because those are the stabilizing lifelines for our souls. We, we have no confidence, we have no hope, we have no stability without knowing who God is and what God has done for us. Jeremiah confronts us in this passage not only with our meditation but also with our inheritance. You might think that's a little bit of a strange way of describing this, but just look at verse 24. Jeremiah says, The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in Him. Do you see this? Our word hope, the second time in this passage. This I call to mind, therefore I have hope. The Lord is my portion, therefore will I hope in Him. What does it mean that the Lord is our portion? It means He's our inheritance. He's our possession. God's people possess God Himself. That's the intimacy of the relationship that God has with His people. This goes all the way back to the book of Exodus in Exodus chapter 6 when God made a promise to the people through Moses when he told them, you will be my people and I will be your God. Jesus has communicated that we are not only in him, but he is in us. Do you see that the intimacy of the relationship that God has with his people? He not only has us as his people, but we have him as our God. The Lord is my portion. Sometimes when we think about eternity and we think about the hope of heaven, we focus so much on the streets of gold and what we're going to be doing there, and I think all those are good things. They're, they're, they're going to be given to us by God. But what is the greatest joy and hope and possession and portion of heaven? It's God Himself. It is the presence of God Himself. That is His greatest gift to us. I don't say this flippantly, and I don't say this irreverently. I say it with all seriousness. Heaven would be hell without God. If you, if you took heaven and you removed God, that is the definition of hell. It's the absence of God and the presence of evil. The Lord is our portion. He is our possession. He is our inheritance. That gives us hope. That is great reason to hope. And so how do we respond to all of this? What do we do in response to all this truth about God and this reality of our relationship with God. Listen to what I, Jeremiah says, how he instructs us. The Lord is good to them that wait for Him, to the soul that seeks Him. It is good that a man should both, there's our word again, hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. In Hebrew, verses 25, 26, and 27 all begin with the same word. They begin with the word, good. Uh, this is part of our acrostic here in chapter 3. 
And it, in the original language, it just stands out to you that these three verses go together. Good, good, good. The Lord is good to those who wait for Him, to the soul that seeks Him. It is good for a man that he should hope and again quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. What is Jeremiah describing here? It is trust. You wait for God. You seek God. You trust in Him. You trust. You wait. You pray. It's really how this whole book concludes. Chapter 5 is one long prayer from Jeremiah to God. Do we respond to the truth of God's character and what He has accomplished for us through Christ and what He has given to us in Christ? Do we respond by trusting Him, waiting on Him, and praying to Him? I, th I thought about ending the message right there. There's kind of a natural conclusion there, but I do want to go on to verse 33, because Jeremiah really raises this question of what if God is chastening you? What if God's afflicting you this morning? What if He's bringing difficulties in your life? How do you respond to God then? Listen to the instruction of Jeremiah. It's good for a man to bear the yoke in his youth. He sitteth alone and keepeth silence because he has borne it upon him. This is a description of submission to the chastening hand of God. He putteth his mouth in the dust. If so be, there may be, there's our word again, hope. He giveth his cheek to him that smiteth him. He is filled full with reproach. All of these are descriptions of submitting ourselves to whatever God chooses to do through his chasing and his affliction. Verse 31, Because for the Lord will not cast off forever, but though he cause grief, Yet will he have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. For he doth not afflict willingly nor grieve the children of men. What Jeremiah is reminding us is that when God deals with his people, when God deals with his children, when God deals with a Christian today and he chastens, his purpose is always to restore. He will not afflict forever. He doesn't willingly afflict. He's not just out to cause you grief. He's out to accomplish something in your life. Are you convinced of that? That God has a good and loving purpose for you. And that to accomplish that good and loving purpose in a world like the one that we live in that's cursed with sin, God brings difficulty into our lives. But He will not afflict forever. His posture toward us as His people, His attitude toward us is one of mercy and compassion and faithfulness to His promises. We, we can trust Him. We can wait upon Him. We can pray to Him. As we conclude our considerations of lamentation, I do just want to direct our attention to the last few verses of the book, this conclusion to Jeremiah's prayer in chapter 5. Look at verse 19. Thou, O Lord, remainest forever, thy throne from generation to generation. Wherefore dost thou forget us forever and forsake us so long time? Turn thou as unto thee, O Lord, and we shall be turned. Renew our days as of old. This is a prayer that God would turn His people and restore His people to Himself. But Thou hast utterly rejected us. Thou art very wroth against us. You hear the mixture in Jeremiah's soul of his confidence in God, and yet the weight and the seriousness and the significance of the affliction that he's facing. We don't minimize the difficulty. We just recognize that by setting our hearts and our souls and our attention on the truth of God and His character and His goodness, we can endure. God's people endure. And so as we come to a close this morning, I have a question for us as we consider all that we've seen here in the book of Lamentations. What will you remember about 2020? 
you might say, well, actually, I'd rather forget 2020. I want to say, no, 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 that's not what we, we do. We don't, we don't scrub these things from our minds. We would lose the lessons that God has for us if we simply say, okay, that was a bad year, mark it off the ledger, I'm just going to scratch that out of my memory. What will you remember about 2020? What will you make your meditation about this last year? What will you call to mind when you have opportunity to think about the last year? Will it be all the frustrations with government restrictions and lockdowns that don't make any sense? Will it be the discouragements and the disappointments of canceled plans? Will you remember the wormwood and the gall of 2020? If you do that, you will be bowed down in your soul. What will you remember? Will you remember the faithfulness of God through a very challenging year? Will you remember and meditate on what God has done for you this last year? the prayers that he has answered. And I know some of you have had significant and direct answers to prayer this year. As a church family, throughout this year, we, we have had matters of concerted prayer where God has shown himself strong and powerful and has responded directly to those prayers of his people. Will we make that our meditation? Will we remember that about 2020? Will you remember God's faithfulness to you through giving you direction for difficult decisions? Again, I, I can think of some in our congregation who were facing incredibly difficult decisions, really felt like they, they didn't have the wisdom to make those choices, and they sought the Lord, and they waited on the Lord, and God gave clear, concrete direction in times of difficulty. Will you remember God's faithfulness to you through that? Will you remember the personal growth that's taken place this year? Yes, much of it spurred by challenging circumstances and things that if we had had our own way and our own choice, we probably wouldn't have endured, and yet God used those things to grow us, to grow us in our maturity, to grow our love for our assembly. I have to tell you, I think this is one of the bedrock core things that God is accomplishing in our hearts. If it's not happening in your heart, it's happening in my heart. Far be it from me to ever think lightly about the privilege of gathering together with God's people to worship Him. Because that can so easily and so quickly be taken away. Do we, do we recognize the growth that's taken place in our own hearts this year? Or the opportunity to minister to others? The Lord, through, through our assembly, has just uh, exploded contacts in our community opportunities to minister to people, to share the gospel, to, to provide counsel and opportunity? Are we going to remember God's faithfulness to us? The Lord has brought us families through this year. A time when you would never think anybody would be going and hanging out with people they, they don't know and haven't met. Are you going to remember God's faithfulness to you and to our assembly by providing opportunities for ministry in 2020? We could go on and on and on. The many, many blessings of, of opportunities for our church family to demonstrate love for one another and to be an encouragement to one another. God is so good to us. Many people think this is the worst year in their life. <laughs> We're doing pretty good if we can think back on our worst year and recognize so unmistakably the faithful and compassionate and merciful and loyal hand of God in our lives. But as we close out 2020, I just have to tell you, you, you might think this last year has been the worst one, but can I encourage you and just tell you, 2021 could be worse. <laughs> How's that for an end of the year encouragement? Next year could be a lot worse. Uh, it's not like you just turn the calendar and all of a sudden you get a fresh start and Everything that you didn't like about 2020 is going to go away. Uh, life doesn't work that way. You say, boy, that's a real downer of a way to end the last sermon of 2020. No, the encouragement is that when the calendar flips over, there is one who remains unchanged, who was faithful the previous year and the year before that and the century before that, <laughs> 
and the millennia before that, and who will remain faithful forever. And so whatever the calendar brings, and whatever the year brings, we can trust and pray and submit and rely on the God of the universe, the maker of heaven and earth, our redeemer, our inheritance, our hope. We can demonstrate love for one another and a compassion for the lost to take the gospel into another year. With me as a church family, would you make that your commitment in the coming year? That when we think of 2020, we meditate on the faithfulness of God to us. And as we look forward to 2021, we are armed with our knowledge of who God is and the commission that He has given to us. To be a salt and a light in this world till our Savior, the Lord Jesus, returns for us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these profound truths that are found even in passages that we think of as tucked away, overlooked. God, you are so good to us. You are so good to us all the time. Would you draw our hearts in affection towards you so that we would love you, we would know you, we would serve you more faithfully. And Father, whatever you have before us in the coming year, the blessings and the challenges, would you grow our submission to your providence, to the sovereignty of your will, because we know that your way is always best. Father, our prayer is that you would gather us together as a church family next Sunday. That you would bring us together to lift our voices in praise and worship and submit ourselves to the truth of your word and the message of the incarnation of our Savior. Would you do that for us as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.